you'd like to open your Bibles, I'd love us to look together, please, at Acts chapter 4, verses 32 to 37. Acts chapter 4, verses 32 to 37. That can be found, if you've got one of the church Bibles, on page 1106. Acts chapter 4, verses 32 to 37. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had needs. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold the field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. We have been in the midst of a series over the last few weeks called Go, where we have been looking at the beginning of the book of Acts. And we have seen what happens when God pours out his power. He always pours out his power for a purpose that we would know him and that we would be uh, drawn into community. He calls us into community and that we would know him and that we would show him uh, to the world. God always pours out his power for a purpose. He calls us into community that we would know him and that we would show him. Uh, Miraculous healings, people being raised from the dead, thousands coming to faith. And then what Luke, the writer of Acts, does is he almost presses pause and uh, hones right in and says, all this amazing stuff is happening, but actually, what's going on at the heart of this move of God? And in this brief passage, we get a glimpse into what is happening right at the heart of this extraordinary move of God is a community, because God always pours out his power for a purpose. He calls us into community that we would know him and that we would show him to the world. That we would know him and that we would show him. And it's as if he wants us to remind us of something that is really, really important. More important now, perhaps, than at any time in history. Verse 32. All the believers were one in heart and mind. All the believers, not some of the believers, all of the believers were one in heart and mind. God always pours out his power for a purpose. He calls us into community. He called them to be a community that knew him and that showed him to the world. There's something extraordinarily powerful, isn't there, about when a group of people are moving together with a common purpose together. People sit up and they want to know what's going on. No one claimed any of their possessions, it says. They shared what they had. Why? Because God had called them into a community. He had called them into a community that they would know him and that they would show him. To be the people of God who he had longed for. Right the way through the history of the Bible, we see God created a a people that would be a community, that would be a light to the world, that would point him, that would in some way reflect who he is, not just his power, but intimacy and love and community, because at the heart of the Godhead is community. And with the early church, we see what happens when power meets people. Community happens. They become a light to the world. Because God always pours out his power for a purpose. He calls us into community that we would know him and that we would show him. And in a culture uh, much like today that was incredibly materialistic, this was so powerful, having a community of people that lived for each other, that lived for Christ and lived for each other. It was so countercultural. 
As much as the miracles were powerful and spoke powerfully of who God was, so did the fact that there was this community who loved each other, that looked out for each other right at the heart of what God was doing. And Jesus promised, didn't he, that this is what would happen when when people would know when they saw the real thing. Jesus said, everyone will know that you are my disciples when you love one another. It is so attractive, so appealing. When I was on my year between school and university, I uh, worked with an organization called Youth with a Mission, YWAM. And what happened while we worked, I went and did a a kind of a a DTS, it's called, Discipleship Training School. And what happens is you have kind of three months Bible training, and then you go out and you do mission. And I went off to do mission with 18 friends. And by the time we got to mission, we were just so close. You know, we lived together for three months, 24-7. You learn to love people when you live with them, 24-7. And we went out on mission, and we went right down to the south of Mexico, to a place called Puerto Escondido. And, um, and you know, we did lots of missions, and we did these appeals, and, and, and then we'd often go off, and we'd like, you know, have a meal together. And I noticed there was this guy who just kind of, he'd come to the meetings, and he'd just kind of follow us along, and he'd sit on a table near us and watch us as we were, you know, talking about what had happened, and, uh, you know, kicking back and laughing. And this happened for a couple of, you know, a couple of, a couple of weeks. And um, eventually, um, he came up to us and said, what is it with you people? I said, beg your pardon? Well, what is it about you? And we were like, sorry, we don't follow. He goes, you love each other. You really like each other. And um, he said, can I hang out? I'm not a Christian, not a believer. Can I just hang out with you guys? And we said, yeah, sure, of course you can. Why don't you come and do some of the kind of mission events with us as well? So this guy, um, he comes along and he, he, um, he does some of the mission stuff with us. And he prays for people with members of the team and they get healed. He does not know what is going on. But he likes it because at the heart of it, more, just as much as the power being poured out, he sees a community of people that love each other and he wants in. Because people want to be part of a community where people love each other, where they walk with each other, where they prefer each other, where Jesus is at the center. Because God always pours out his power for a purpose. He draws us into community that we would know him and that we would show him. We can't help showing him. It's just a byproduct of what happens when he fills us with his spirit, when we get excited about him, and we start hanging out with other people who know him and love him. It just kind of you know, affects people around us. It's been said that although we are the most connected generation ever, we are also the most isolated doesn't matter how hard Facebook tries, or Instagram tries, or Bebo tries, or Twitter tries, or whoever it is this week tries. A virtual community is not the same as a real thing. And think about it for a second. Most of the social networks were invented by introverts. <laughs> meant they didn't actually have to talk to anyone. You cannot fake the real thing. Somewhere where people are loved unconditionally for who they are, where they begin to be themselves, where they begin to share what they have with other people, not because someone's told them, but because that is a byproduct of what happens when we encounter Jesus, when we receive his love for us. We want to share our lives, share our stuff with other people. We want to be part of a community where that happens. A community actually like this. Where we look out for each other, where we love each other. Pastorates, uh, different groups within the church. People want to be a part of that. Now, um, I'm going to let you into a little secret. I am what is known as a stealth geek. What that means is that I'm a geek, but I don't want anyone to know. 
Um, uh, particularly when it comes to technology, which I guess makes me a stealth tech geek. Or at least I was a stealth tech geek until just now. Uh, but um, there was one time where there, were, there was this new phone coming out. There was nothing particularly wrong with my other phone. I mean, it, it made calls. But this new phone was coming out, and I'd, I'd heard that there were going to be quite a lot of people who wanted this phone. There were going to be queues outside the, the, the phone shop near where I lived. So I decided I was going to get up really early. I mean, like 5 a.m. I never, ever, ever get up at 5 a.m. Like, ever. And, uh, and I got up, because I, I wanted to be one of the people who would own one of these new phones. So I got up, and I kind of staggered. I'm very bad first thing in the morning. Radar's off. I kind of drool. Uh, 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 in fact, when I was at university in the States, uh, people used to go to breakfast just to see what I looked like first thing in the morning. I got a round of applause one time. Anyway, uh, I staggered to the phone shop, and there was already quite a line. This is 5.30 in the morning for a telephone. So uh, I joined the queue, and to begin, and the queue gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and people start getting slightly suspicious. You know, when people look out the corner of their eyes at you, you, will you have one, and will I not have one? And, you know, rumors went up and down the line. And, um, and by 6 o'clock, three hours before the shop opened, we had word that they would have enough phones for everybody in the line. Everybody relaxed. We started talking to each other. We started uh, introducing ourselves to each other. I was stood next to a, a, a tube driver on the northern line who had taken the day off to get a phone. <laughs> and, um, and um, you know, we kind of talked about how excited we were. You know, this, this phone was, um, you know, you could, you could download apps like Snake. You could uh, connect to the internet really fast. Uh, it had a camera. And uh, it even made phone calls. <laughs> and uh, someone next to us actually went and got a group of us a cold cup of tea. You know, we were you know, kind of you know, hanging. And um, eventually the doors opened and we were kind of cheered in and you know, we signed our contracts. And someone said, wow, this is amazing. This is like, we're a community. I didn't like to break it to him, but he had come up from Seven Oaks uh, at 3 a.m. to join the line to buy a telephone. The likelihood of me seeing him again was very, very remote. We were not a community. But what that spoke of was this longing that people have to be a community. Nothing wrong with the bridge club, the golf club, the gym, anything, nothing wrong with the book club. There's nothing wrong with any of those groups at all. Some of them are quite good, but they are not the real thing. You don't do life in an authentic way with people you push weights with in the gym. People in the gym are either there trying to get bigger or smaller. <laughs> in my case, smaller. People are longing. Uh, for community. But how do we become this kind of community? Well, first of all, we make Jesus central. We are called to know him. We're called in community. We're called to know him. It all begins with encountering Jesus. That is what happens. You read the book of Acts. It is about a group of people who hung out with Jesus. They got to know Jesus. He filled them with his power. They had an extraordinary encounter with him. Put Jesus at the center of the community and you can do extraordinary things. Because God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. He is the only person who says uh, that he is the giver of life. He's the one who says, uh, I have come that you would have life in all its fullness. The book club doesn't offer that. The gym, the bridge club, the golf club, whatever it is, you know, your work colleagues, they do not offer that. Life ultimately comes from Jesus. We find we want to open ourselves up to him. And then what happens is we find we want to open ourselves up to other people. Because we've experienced and encountered the love of God, we're different. It is not possible 
to encounter the love and power of God and stay the same. We encounter the love and the power of God and we open ourselves up and we want to find other people who are like us, who love Jesus, who want more of him, who want to serve him. And the second thing that happens is we need to look out. He's called us to show him to the world. Of course, through acts of power and healings and all that kind of stuff. But also by how we love each other. How we look out for each other. How we walk with each other. That in itself, in a self-centered, narcissistic, materialistic culture, is a powerful testimony that something is going on. People want to be a part of that. It says in verse 34, God's grace was so powerful at work in them that there were no needy persons among them. Because what happens is as we get filled with the power of God, as we encounter Jesus, as we experience his love, we want to look after the people around us. We can't help it. It just happens. I see examples of this in this community all the time. It's not just about money. Focus, for those of you who are there, is amazing. My kids disappeared off and had a fantastic time for most of the day. They came back for food and money. (laughs) But people gave up a week of their holiday to look after my children. People gave up a week of their holiday so so that the video stuff all worked. People gave up a week of their holiday to serve many of us, and then they went back to work. That was their holiday. That is what happens when Jesus pours his power upon us. He always pours out his power for a purpose, that we would would be called in community, that we would know him, and that we would show him. Imagine going back to work. How was your holiday? Great. I was with 30 children all by myself in Mablethorpe in a caravan park. Wow, why would you do that? Because, you know, Jesus, that's a powerful witness. Another friend of mine, he doesn't have much money, but um, he was inspired by a, the former church warden of this church, a man called Mick Hawkins. He's, he's dead now. But Mick always used to give people lift home. So this guy decided that he was going to, he couldn't give money, but he could give his car. He could use his car. So he became like li- Mr. Lift. Anyone wanted a lift, he was there. And he announced to his pastorate that uh, he was going to give everyone who got, anyone who got in his car that night a lift home. That is dangerous. So he dropped someone off in Wandsworth, he dropped someone off in Hammersmith, and then he dropped someone off in Portsmouth. (laughs) And then he got in his car, and he drove all the way home. The person who he dropped off in Portsmouth, their family was blown away. What a witness. So practical. Why are you here at one o'clock in the morning? My friend drove me here. Oh, is your friend nearby? No, no, he's driving back to London. Isn't that amazing? When we decide that God's love has been poured out upon us, that we would know him and that we'd show him, it is a testimony to others. Uh, Another friend of mine, um, he heard that a family in this church um, who didn't have a lot of money, uh, their TV broke. And if you have small children, you know like TV sometimes can be a lifesaver. Not often, but sometimes. And uh, he got a bonus. So you know what he did with his bonus? He brought the largest television I have ever seen. I mean, it is enormous. And he gave it to them. That's quite a powerful testimony. Walk into the living room. Wow, that's a big TV. Yeah, do you know what? Someone from our church just bought it for us. Amazing. Really practical. Somebody else um, we know, they, they like doing mystery shopping for people. So they just order some, some food from the supermarket and deliver it. Get it delivered to people who need it. Uh, Last year, my wife, Nikki, she had to go to New Zealand for a competition. She's an athlete. And um, she was worried. Uh, We've got three boys. She was worried that basically they were not going to go to bed on time and they were going to eat junk food for 10 days. That's probably not entirely unfounded, given that my two favorite meals are pizza and chicken ding. Chicken ding, just so you know, is chicken, when you put it in the microwave, when it's cooked, it goes ding. <laughs> so chicken ding and pizza. But you know, a family in the church, uh, I think they knew me, um, 
And, uh, and what they did is they organized food for 10 days for us. So Nikki didn't have to worry for 10 days uh, about what we were going to eat. It was all provided for us. Uh, I bumped into one of my friends, and he, he's not a believer. And he said, oh, how are you doing? How are the kids doing on chicken ding, popcorn, and pizza? I said, you know, the amazing thing is we haven't had any. Like, none. Why, why not? You know, this couple in our church, this family in our church, they just organized food for 10 days for us. My mum also helped uh, with picking up the children from school and that kind of thing. But that is a powerful testimony. Do you get that out, out in the world? Do you get people organizing 10 days worth of food for you? Not because I was ill. Not because, you know, there's you know, something terribly wrong. Just because uh, they want to bless people. And they want to you know, make sure my children don't eat pizza and popcorn and fizzy pop uh, for two weeks, 10 days. It's amazing what happens. It is so powerful. It's such a powerful witness to people. And, that, and this community, God pouring out his power for a purpose that would be drawn into community, that we would know him and that we would show him. That is a story of so many of the alpha uh, stories that we hear, isn't it? I walked in. I felt like I was at home. I came to love my small group. I felt loved and accepted for who I was. I felt like I could be myself. Because God, when he pours out his power, he always does it for a purpose. He draws us into community that we would know him and that we would show him. That was my experience. I met people who are Christians, were Christians, and there was something different about them. I couldn't put my finger on it at first. There was something different about them. I came on the Alpha Course, and there were loads of them who were like that. You know, they were the kind of people who, when someone left, spoke even nicer things about them when they were gone than when they were there. I heard the gospel. I received the power of the Holy Spirit, but I saw the gospel in this community that I became a part of. Because God always pours out his power for a purpose, that we would know him and that we would show him in the context of community. In the context of community. You know, while I was thinking and preparing uh, for this talk, I was just spending some time uh, with the Lord, just uh, quietly. And um, I was just saying, Lord, I just want uh, more of you. Because the thing is, once you've uh, received and encountered the love of God, you just want more. You want more for yourself, but you want more for everybody that you know. I said, Lord, I, I just want more of you. And he said, you can have as much of me as you want. All I want is you. All I want is you. Because a community is made up of people who have experienced the love and the power of God, who have been transformed by the love and the power of God, who have felt themselves drawn to other people who have experienced the love and the power of God, who begin to reflect the love and the power of God to the world. He always pours out his power for a purpose. Are you getting this? That we would uh, be called into community, that we would know him and that we would show him. You cannot know him and not show him. It's not possible. But it begins, it begins with us knowing him. I wonder if there are people uh, here this morning and actually, the truth is, you feel desperately isolated. You may have lots of friends. You may have a great life. But actually, inside, you feel this uh, isolation that I was talking about. I meet so many people. And their story is, when it gets to the heart of it, is I feel alone. Now, that may not be you. 
You may have experienced the love and the power of God. You may be part of a community, a pastorate, uh, something, where you, you gathered around other people, where you know him and, that you, and you show him. So I may just be speaking to one person here. But God has called us to know him. And when we know him, things begin to change. He's here this morning. He's here today. And he wants to give you all of himself. He wants to give you more of himself. He's waiting for you to ask. And when that happens, we find we want to give ourselves to him. All he wants is us. It's not difficult. When we live in the knowledge and the experience of the love and the power of God encountering him on a daily basis. And he will draw us into community with others. He has called us into community.